two, All right. Third two. Third How's that two. going? Third two. Third two. You got it. Good to be with you. Thank you, Mariachis, for being here and making us so proud and doing such a great job. To Johnny for getting us kicked off and for each of you joining us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. It's a little windy, but that's okay, right? We're, we're under this beautiful sky, which is right where I started today. My youngest, Henry, and I went on a run, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. And we saw our friend John walking his dog. We ran past the Franklin Mountains, the entrance to which is open and accessible because this community decided some point in the past that we didn't want to develop it, that we wanted to preserve it, and we all wanted to be able to enjoy it. Well, we got home, uh, walked over to El Paso High, where we watched our oldest son, Ulysses, play in a basketball game against the Jefferson Silver Foxes. Let's hear it for Jefferson. Let's hear it for El Paso High. Let's hear it for basketball. And then tomorrow, uh, if, if she's able to prevail, uh, Molly's talking to us about leading us on a trail ride up in the valley in La Union, and we'll be under this same beautiful sky in this same gorgeous, beautiful community. And if that weren't already good enough, we are drinking beer in the middle of the day on a Saturday. Thank you, Jeff Beach, for, for hosting us and, and making this so good. Beer makes everything better. I just, uh, I was talking to Angela over here and she, she told me that she had campaigned with my dad in the 70s and 80s and my dad, Pat O'Rourke, no longer with us, but I know he would appreciate the way in which we're getting together right now. And the spirit of joy and the fun that we're going to have when we do the most important, critical, crucial thing we could be doing with our lives over the course of the next year. I want you to remember just how beautiful this day is, the people around you, the pride, the fierce orgullo that you have in this community. When you hear people like our current governor demean, demonize, and vilify the places that we come from, those homes in which we're raising our kids right now, communities just like this one in El Paso that seem to serve as a prop to stoke anxiety or fear or even hatred for those with whom we live. It was this governor talking about an invasion of people coming to this country. This governor who said we must take matters into our own hands and defend ourselves. Well, when you look around at the people who are here, when you think about just how beautiful and wonderful this community is and how lucky we are to live in it, I want to make sure that you don't just keep that to yourself. Share that with the people in your lives who don't necessarily live in El Paso. In fact, today on Twitter, we started this thread where we're asking you to post your pictures of the border because when the governor does this photo op in front of the wall, when he tries to scare us about who we are at our best, I want you to help me remind the rest of the state that the best of us are right here on the U.S.-Mexico border, right? And you know those, those words about invasion, about taking matters into your own hands, about we must defend ourselves. He wrote to us in all capital letters on the eve of the August 3rd, 2019 massacre here in El Paso. We know perhaps better than anyone else that those aren't just words, that it's not just the conversation that you have in our politics today, that it's actually cause for incitement because there are people who are listening to that person who sits in the highest position of public trust in the land. People like that man who drove more than 600 miles to come to this country to repel that invasion that he'd been warned about with a weapon of war that he purchased online that's better used on a battlefield and certainly shouldn't be anything that any of us are ever up against. Yeah. Well, the way that we came through and ultimately overcame that tragedy here in this community, 
was by being there for one another, out of a sense of responsibility and duty, never asking any of the victims or any of the families who lost a loved one who it is you pray to, how you love, how many generations you've been in this country, or whether you're even a U.S. citizen. We don't care, no me importa what party you belong to, Republicans, Democrats, independents alike, you're in the right place here. And when Pastor Grady, who came very close to losing his daughter in that massacre on that day in the Walmart in our community, was not only worried about taking care of her, he was worried about taking care of all of us. And that exemplifies this community. That's who we were then, that's who we are right now, today. And from that experience, we have built extraordinary trust amongst one another. And I think that's the example that we should and can and will set for the rest of the state because so many of the things that Johnny was talking about right now that describe a Texas that is off track are a function of the failure of trust that we have in this state right now. We have a governor who does not trust Texas. He doesn't trust border communities. If he would listen to us, we would tell him that we don't need any more walls or militarization. We need leadership. Let Texas, all of us together, say to the rest of the country, this is what we want our immigration laws to look like from our own experience. We want people who come to this country to do it the right way, to follow the law. We want there to be order and not chaos, but we have the best idea because of the best experiences in how to make that happen. Instead of pouring money into walls, how about into our schools or into our infrastructure or into the bridges that connect us with our sisters and brothers in Ciudad Juarez? I'd like to see that going forward. We have a governor that does not trust local leadership. I know that Commissioner Stout is here when he and the county judge and the commissioner's court tried to put in place the best public health safeguards for all of us in the midst of the worst pandemic in the last 102 years, the governor wouldn't let him. And you know what the consequence of that is? So many people died so quickly in this community that we set up not one, but 10 mobile morgues to handle all of those who are dying in our lives, our friends, our families, our neighbors. And because he's prevented the local school board, and teachers and principals from protecting the kids in their midst by just asking them to wear a mask, Texas today leads the country in the number of kids who are in hospitals because of COVID. That's the consequence of not trusting local leadership in communities like ours. Greg Abbott doesn't trust voters, and that's why he has made it harder to vote in this state than in any other in the union. When you see people lined up six hours deep on election day, and you're tempted to swell with pride, given that dedication to our democracy, think about the shame that we should feel, that we ask any of those among us to go through that kind of dedication and devotion to our democracy, because we know there are far too many because of their physical condition, because of the jobs they work, because of the kids or parents they're taking care of who can't afford to wait in a line for six hours. Greg Abbott, he doesn't trust those fine women and men in law enforcement who begged him not to sign a permitless carry bill into law that allows anyone to carry a loaded firearm in public. Though there were 35,000 licenses to carry a firearm denied, over the last five years because law enforcement said this person poses too much of a danger to themselves, to our community, to carry that gun in public. All of them will now be able to do that. And the tens of thousands more who knew better than to request a license to carry because they'd never passed a background check, they're armed and loaded on our streets right now too. We have four of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history in this state just in the last four years. This makes no sense. But the worst, perhaps the worst of them all, is the fact that Greg Abbott does not trust the women of Texas. He has signed into law a bill that not only outlaws abortion and prevents any woman from making her own reproductive health care decisions, it places 
a $10,000 bounty on the head of anyone who assess any woman in making a decision about herself, her body, her health care, or her future. You cannot make this stuff up. It is stranger than fiction. But it's happening right now in this state. And it's because he's not listening to us. He does not trust us. And so his policies do not reflect us. He's not doing the things that we want him to do. Focus on those priorities, not of Democrats or Republicans or only the people of El Paso, but all of us here in Texas, like great jobs, world-class public schools, common sense ideas like making sure that if you're sick, you can afford to see a doctor. I don't think that's asking too much. I mentioned that we are a border community. We are a city of immigrants, and our success is not in spite of those things. It is because of those things. But we are also a city of underdogs, and we always have been, and that has never, ever before stopped us. Literally, the book of the underdogs, Los de Abajo, was written on South Oregon Street, just blocks from where we are a little bit more than a hundred years ago. In 1924, Dr. Lawrence Nixon, who started the first chapter of the NAACP in the state of Texas right here in this community, he stood up against the all-white Democratic primary law, fought it for 20 years, took two cases successfully to the Supreme Court right here from El Paso, and finally, in 1944, won the ultimate decision that allowed him and anyone who looked like him to vote in our elections. Thelma White, who graduated from the all-black Douglas High School in 1954, tried to enroll at Texas Western College, denied on the account of the color of her skin. She takes her case to the court of R.E. Thomason and in the process integrates higher education, not just here in El Paso, but across the state of Texas. And then Raymond Teus, in 1957, fighting the odds, never tell us the odds here in El Paso, fighting the political machine, the status quo, the structure of power that existed at that time, became the first Mexican-American to win election to mayor in any major city in the United States. That happened right here. And it's not just in politics and civil rights and voting rights. It's also in our achievement in sports. The 1949 Bowie Bears from right here in Segundo Valle, who won the first boys state baseball championship, even though their mothers had to knit their uniforms out of scrap material. Um, they were using hand-me-down gloves and baseballs. They passed restaurants and motels on their way to Austin that said no dogs, no Mexicans allowed. They didn't have enough money to get a hotel room and maybe they wouldn't have been allowed to sleep in it if they had. And they slept under the bleachers in the stadium that they would play on the next day and they won that game. They beat that team and they came right here from the city of El Paso. The 66 Miners, the 2009 Socorro Bulldogs. We are living in an embarrassment of riches, of tenacity of courage, of folks who overcome the odds. Well, look, we have another underdog team right here, right now. That is all of us. And with your help, with this team behind me, we are going to win this race for governor of the state of Texas. And we're gonna get this state on the right track. A state that is gonna be representative of all of us, big enough for any of us, and certainly the place where we welcome your dreams and the hard work, the effort, and the tenacity to realize them. But if we're going to do this, if we're gonna accomplish those goals that bring us together, that aren't the party positions of the Republicans or Democrats, but the values of all Texans, great jobs, world-class schools, common sense ideas like expanding Medicaid, or making sure that we finally legalize marijuana so that we're not putting people behind bars for a substance that is legal in most of the rest of the country already. If we're going to do these great things, we've got to win this important election. And the only way that we're going to do it is to come together again, just like we always have when it really counts, when the odds are against us, and everything that we care about 
is on the line. So I'm asking you to join me in this effort to sign up and be a part of this campaign. There are tables in the back. Cynthia, where are those tables? There are folks walking around. There are tables in the back. If you want to sign up, we will put you to work on a volunteer shift knocking on doors. In fact, tomorrow in the east side of El Paso, we're going to be knocking on doors for this campaign. If you have nothing better to do, then join us. Because as important as this campaign is, and as wonderful as it is for us to be together, we are not going to win this one on the sidelines, right? I love when you retweet what we post on Twitter. I love your comments on Facebook. I love all that stuff that we're doing on the internet and social media, but none of that is gonna get the job done. This has to happen in person, eyeball to eyeball, face to face, human being with human being. That's how we're going to make this happen, and I'm gonna need you in this. So. Are you ready and willing to join this campaign? Well, it is the honor of my life to lead this campaign with you. And together, we're going to win this race and get Texas on the right track. Thank you all for being here today. So grateful to everyone here in El Paso. We're gonna hang out for a little bit, drink a beer, say hello to anybody who'd like to, and then take a picture. And that internet that I just dragged right now. If you want to post those pictures on the internet, that's good too. All right. Thank you, everybody. Adios. Nos vemos. Hey.